This episode may contain strong language and adult themes. Viewer and listener discretion is advised. Welcome to oh, what was it, episode something, I think it's episode 29 of the uh, 22 Dropouts. Uh, as you can see from the top of the screen, uh, why not check us out on our social media channels because one day we will get somebody who does this for us and they might do a better job of, uh, of it than we normally do. But you can check us out on our Twitter, Instagram and Facebook page. Just go and check at 22 Dropouts. Uh, now, uh, say hello to uh, people in my 22 uh, when I can find the, uh, the the right screen. Hello, guys. You're all on. Um, we've got James. Hello, James. Say hello to the viewers. Uh, yeah, you're in Scotland, not Wales. Uh, Phil, over in Vegas, say hello to the viewers. All Good to talk. Them. Good to talk. October 1st, yeah. yeah. Hey, we haven't done that yet. Next week, guys, Lederhosen. Lederhosen next week. Lederhosen. Okay. I'll, I will wear my lederhosen yeah. next week. Um, and um, I, looking very uncomfortable tonight uh, is a man who has never watched the show before. <laughs> um, so he's in for one hell of a rude awakening. Um, but actually, th- yeah, uh, yeah, 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 that one. Um, Space Festival's Wallet and Watch. Um, although this man probably knows more about my journey through puberty than my father. Oh, gosh. Um, <laughs> oh, dear. Uh, and, uh, and if you're wondering why and you're turning off now, you don't need to because uh, Mr. Simon Robson, yes, sir, sorry, sir, uh, was my head of PE and head of rugby at school, at high school. Um, now, he's not just famous for being my PE teacher. Uh, Mr. Robson, sir, sorry, sir, is uh, also famous, um, not because of his son, Dan, who's actually quite a rather good rugby player. And some of you may know him from what. In fact, you may recognise this bit. And before we go into Simon, I'm just going to show you this video. Take a look at this. Did you see any similarities there? Um, I suspect he got that from his dad somewhere along the line, strangely enough. And now you know. You see, things do run in the family, which is why Christopher is a complete tosser like me. Uh, but there you go. Um, and that's why he's a referee. Like, in, fact, in fact, Simon has done everything in rugby. If you think that Miss, uh, Sir Mr. Bill Beaumont, CBEDL and all that lot, uh, hello, Lord Sir, um, if you think he's Mr. Rugby, then Simon has been a player. Uh, in fact, de- you, what you've seen now is his debut for Mosley back in the day. Uh, he's um, Simon, how many times did you um, sit on the bench for England? Uh, five times, unfortunately. Never got, they never were got the it. days where yeah, you, um, you had to actually be injured before you'd be taken off. You had to be bleeding or broken. So, uh, un- unfortunately, we didn't have finishers back then, but uh, you, had, you had a very good career back in the day, including, look, look at these. Um, Simon, just, you don't have to say this uh, truthfully if you don't. How old are you? Well, I, I mean, that's, uh, you're asking the question now. You said that, that obviously, I was your um, head of rugby, etc. but I'm, I'm only 59. I know I don't look it, but I'm, I'm 59. Yeah, it just yeah. shows how old I am, yeah. I just wondered, because um, it seems to me that, Colour film had not been invented when you were 
when you were playing rugby because every photograph we found is in black and white. That's correct because obviously in those days the black and white are the, are the classy pictures, aren't they? They don't want colour pictures in those That's days. Exactly yeah, they don't they, 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 you lose that. You lose the age lines, don't you? So even the old boys would look good in it, um, which is why I'm going more and more towards black and white than I am towards colour these days. Um, now, It'll still shine off the top of your head. The lights down there and the lights behind there. I have got no light. Well, oh, actually, I might have done a bit. <laughs> Excuse me, Mr. Mill. I'm ready for my close-up. Can I have some powder? Uh, <laughs> so, Simon, you, you went on um, after you'd, you'd finished playing and um, started in the coaching and the teaching role. Is that right? Yeah, I mean, obviously, I was teaching for... Um, I was a teacher, but I, I, I carried on coaching. Uh, mainly at a, a reasonably good junior level with um, Stoke-on-Trent and Longton. Both got into the National Leagues at the time uh, when the game was still pretty much amateur. Um, I had some success there, but it's it's a very stressful business coaching. So I got out of that a few years ago and I do a little bit now because it's easy when you're retired to just come in and do a little bit of coaching. But I'm doing a bit of refereeing now as well, which I enjoy just to keep fit. So yeah, Back to the dark side. Yeah, yeah. He has, he has entered the dark side. However, Simon, how on earth with those hips do you keep up? And I'm not being mean here, but Simon, how many hip replacements have you had? Yeah, hip resurfacing. Uh, I mean, Andy Murray had it and he's still playing tennis. He's had a hip I, exactly. Hip Andy, Murray's only, Andy Murray's only 31. No, there's no way he should be playing tennis after what he had done. I mean, it's incredible that he's even anywhere near playing uh, uh, that that level after having what he's had done, um, and he's going to need a he's going to have problems later on in life. But I'm sure he doesn't. I'm sure he doesn't mind that. The, the money will look after him a little bit more than it was in the amateur game in rugby, where you just got battered and had no medical uh, backup at all. But hey, wouldn't change it for wouldn't change it for the world. Plenty of brown yeah. envelopes in your boots, though. Uh, no, I didn't play in Wales. Um, uh-huh. You didn't mostly. <laughs> Mosley, the, the, the top club I played at at Mosley, they paid you 10p a mile and they knocked off 10 miles either way on the journey because they wouldn't pay expenses if you lived within 10 miles of the club. So they were really tight. It was really tight. <laughs> that oh, sounds like Simon, referee in yeah. Staffordshire, to be fair, Simon. Oh, Staffordshire was Look, much better. Like, you guys could talk rugby all, all day long here. The, the real elephant in the room is he was your gym teacher. Is that correct? Yeah, uh, I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't say I was ever any good at something called gym. Oh. I wouldn't even say I was very good Just at rugby. Play. To be fair, we're gonna we're <laughs> gonna get to this interview here right away. <laughs> Simon, if you had to compare Mike to a an animal when it came to physical capabilities in playing a sport, what would you what would be the comparison? Oh, oh, oh good question. Me a cat. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I was more like an ostrich when anybody ran well, at me. Yeah, I mean, you know, no, I could tackle. I just couldn't run very quickly back then. Uh-huh. <laughs> now, do you know what? I was going to give you, because look, you've already, you've already gone down that, haven't you? You've taken up the whistle. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. What, whatever possessed you, sir? Uh, because I spent 37 years uh, shouting at referees. I thought... Uh, I'll just, you know, I, and I quite enjoyed doing it at school when I was doing the under 30s, 14s, etc., and doing and refereeing. So it was actually a, a good way to keep fit, and B, um, I got, get quite a few games at the local rugby, at Newcastle Rugby Club, which is literally five minute walk for me, so I can have a few pints afterwards and and wow. um, whatever. So it's actually get, I get both of that. To be honest, I do mainly under 18 games, and they they get the, the you know I've, I've tours at that level for. My, my life so I actually know how they operate and how they work so I actually quite enjoy it um I so yeah you realized why we used to get fed up with you shouting at us when you're on the sideline absolutely absolutely well you, you mellow as you get older don't you mellow as you get older <laughs> well we've got a really special surprise for it like it's not very special actually but it is it is all the way from Las Vegas uh, and when I see you soon, I will make sure this gets to you. Uh, and it's just because you've turned to the dark side, sir, you can have your very own Back 10 Pros referee Ooh. wallet. And not only has it got a yellow and a red card, but look at this. They don't come out. <laughs> <laughs> but even the cards have got Back 10 Pros pinned. 
printed on it. That's that means smart. now what you've got to do is come over to the States with us uh, and do a tournament next year. Right, yeah, okay. That's that's going to be on the cars, isn't it? When the, uh, when the car, travel, car travel down the road to the blooming uh, supermarket. It's, uh, <laughs> you know, at school, there are actually, there are tour companies now asking about signing schools up to do tours in 2024 and 2025 because they just... Uh, they've got to get the deposits somehow, haven't they? The deposits, yes, because they're so desperate for people to want to go on tour. And obviously the next year or so is going to be very, very doubtful. Uh, we've had to cancel I, I think it's probably going... You're right. It's more doubtful for schools, isn't it, than it's going to be for uh, for, for other establishments. You know, seniors will still, it'll still go on tour. Sevens will go on tour. As soon as that door opens, as soon as somewhere, somewhere like the Dubai Invitational is on, you're going to see people flocking on. Um, people are, so, are going to be so desperate after 18 months that they're going to go. You would think so, yeah. I mean, but... But at the moment, it all seems that everything's a little bit doom and gloom at the moment, isn't it? That's the thing. It's... Yeah, so let's let, well, let's talk about doom and gloom a little bit, because um, as we've alluded to in, in our little video show reel, um, you, um, uh, you still have more hair than your son might, uh, might but um, yeah. will you two stop it with the Coke Wars? Or, look, right, I am going to now um, pin you both uh, onto, onto screen, uh, when I work out how to do this, and I want to see, there you go, I want to see the Coke Wars now. Who's got the best? Come on, work it, girls, work it. Look at that. Oh, yeah, oh, you want <laughs> you. Yeah, well, oh. Simon's rubbing his, his oh, is yeah. more exciting. Oh. Nice oh. and cold, nice and cold. Tired. Coke's and more likely, the Coke's more likely to shoot out the top as well. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure how that's going to go down with the viewers. Uh, I'm not sure how that's going to go down with the regulator and Ofcom either. But um, if, if, if Mr. Robson, sorry, sir, uh, if his coat spills out the top, we all know why, because that technique was just sublime down the side of your can. Um, I'll give you that one, Simon. <laughs> I, I, never thought about, I never thought about caressing my drink. I actually thought about drinking it. Yeah. <laughs> So which school did you go to, Michael? Uh, I went to Mr. Robson. Sorry, sir, school. Which, which school is that? Uh, Newcastle on the Lime School. In fact, I dug out one of my old training T-shirts today, which still surprisingly fits me. I thought, I'll wear that. Was it stretchy? Oh, yeah, it was very stretchy. The problem is, <laughs> some idiots put the sponsor on the front and Newcastle School on the back. So I could have done the entire show without pulling my headset out like this, but that really wouldn't have worked because I couldn't work the computer then. Uh, oh, it might be better for the man. viewers, although you would see a different side to my ball patch, uh, on, which I only ever on. see when I'm watching myself on TV and I get that high camera angle. And I, I never believe it's me, you know, never. HD, like, H, HD floodlights are worse, Mike. It's like a bloody beacon shining off the top. <laughs> Mike, do you mean to tell me that you still have a T-shirt from high school, which is like 30 plus years old? How dare you, sir? How yes. very dare you? Um, I, no, I got given it uh, several years later when I started refereeing again <laughs> at the school because, okay. of course, I escaped and moved down south for about 15 years. But actually, uh, I think Dan was at school and I was refing him um, about that sort of time when I started. Uh, how old is Dan now? Was he 28? Yeah, he's about 28. Yeah, he's 28. Yeah, so I, I, I just, when, he was in the when he was in the first... I'd have probably just been, I'd have refereed him then, and then obviously um, at the local clubs as well. Uh, but um, uh, what were we talking about? Christ almighty, I've got no idea what we were talking about. Refereeing. So, Refereeing. Referee. So, yeah, just before we, um, we, we go for a, a quick break uh, and try and regain our thoughts. Simon, sir. Sorry, sir. Don't call me, um, sir. It's, it's disconcerting. <laughs> Do you know what? Um, and I know most of you won't know this, but um, the, the funniest moment of my refereeing career, I think, was when Tosh Askew had to call me, sir, uh, when I said, um, please don't keep shouting, Mike, you're wrong. Uh, and he I, said, sorry, I, sir. I removed, uh, so I, re I, I removed him from the touchline 
when Newcastle played Lynn in one of my very early games and I was being assessed and he was being very obnoxious and very loud and I, I dressed him down in front of all the kids and removed him from the side of the field and I got Tosh, a dressing being and, I got, and I got a dressing down from my school teacher assessor saying that I shouldn't do that in front of children. <laughs> I think Tosh got removed from more than one game. There's no doubt about it. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm glad you didn't lose that, uh, l- uh, learn that from him. Um, uh, I think he took it from uh, Mr. Moss Bobit, to be fair. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. There, was a, there was a few old taskmasters back there. I remember my very first PE lesson was, uh, don't you dare talk, get down and give me 50. I'm like, what? No, you've talked again, that's another 50. Um, you learned the hard way back then. Yeah, you can't do that now. It's child cr- cruelty and, and children can't they? You just can't do it. Utter nonsense. Utter nonsense. Thank, thank you for saying it. <laughs> and on that, on that bump shower, we're just going to take a quick break and we'll be back with you right after this. When you need clear and concise match official communication systems, look no further than the brand new AxiWe AT350. Radios are always that they're always useful, they always help us, especially AxiWe's where all three of us can be open at any time, we can have open communication. Available now from refcomsglobal.net. Invest in profits into match official development worldwide. Uh, welcome back to part two of the 22 Dropouts, where, yes, yet again, it is going to be pick on Mike night uh, with uh, with my old uh, school rugby master, Mr. Simon Robson. Sir, sorry, sir, won't do it again, sir. Um, now, Simon, um, we have we have mentioned the fact that you uh, are a famous father to quite a famous son as well. Uh, in, in that uh, Dan Robson, the uh, uh, the Wasps the scrum half. And now England's scrum half as well. Uh, take a look at this. Look how happy Mr. Robson he is with this photograph at Twickenham. Um, Dan is supposed to be playing in the Premiership final at Twickenham this Saturday. And we, uh, we're recording this on the Monday night. Now, uh, as many people will know, that Wasps had uh, an outbreak of COVID last week uh, and had to do some more tests again on Saturday. Uh, Simon, what's the latest that you've heard from from Dan and the team? Uh, the latest is that they got tested on Saturday, and there were four uh, positive, uh, four more positive tests. One, one within the playing squad. Uh, unfortunately, that means um, they basically have got to be retested again tomorrow. If there are any further positives, then they're going to have to withdraw from uh, from the final on on Saturday. Um, it's it's one of those very difficult situations. There's nothing anybody can do. They've been extremely careful, as you can imagine. It's um, the first, in fact, uh, as far as I'm aware, two of the tests were false positives on the first round of testing, which doesn't help in terms no, of how not at all. it goes. But they've not they've kept away from training as a as a squad. Dan's been in doing some individual stuff but they've not actually trained for the final now for a week. So if they get no positives on Tuesday, which will be Wednesday morning when they get the results, then they should be OK to go ahead and they will have virtually the same squad uh, that played in the semi-final because it's uh, they're certainly the, the first uh, the four players that were positive on the first round were academy players who live in right, the same... Okay. So it's, you know, it's one of those, it's... They've been very careful in their track and trace, but uh, it's just the times we live in, and I don't think it's not nobody's to blame, nobody's at fault. Um, with the best will in the world, it's not ideal, and I don't think Bristol, if Bristol get take Wasp place, would be an ideal way in which to finish that particular season. But that's what uh, the, you know. Television wants a final, and they're going to get a final. And Pat Lamb has actually gone on a record this afternoon saying he, he very much hopes that Wasps, you know, are OK to play in the final. He, I think there's a feeling that they don't feel they're, they're, they've earned their right to play in the final. But obviously, they're, they're, it's part of premiership regulations. That's, that's what it, it'll, they'll do. Um, and it would be a shame, but it's not the same. It's not the same as playing in front of 80,000 people in the premiership final 
um, as it should be, which is a shame for the guys because for some players it might be the only chance they ever get to play in a Premiership final and to play in front of nobody is not ideal. But as I say, you just got to you just got to get on with it. It's they've done very well to get the season in last season. Uh, there's been a bit of criticism over it, but I think it's 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 the guys would rather be playing than not doing anything and or training. So they've quite enjoyed it, actually. So it is what it is. So we'll see on Wednesday morning. Um, fingers crossed that there's no more positives. If that, then, as I said, they should be OK to to go ahead. But obviously, they've got to make contingency plans for for the final. Yeah. And the D-Day is, is Wednesday, isn't it? Uh, according to Premiership Rugby. Yeah, they'll get, the, they'll get results from Tuesday's test on Wednesday morning. So we'll know and then. Dan, Dan's obviously been, been clear all the way through. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's, he's That's clear. good. The, the, the majority of the senior players are all clear and, and the, they should have very similar side. It was always that double-edged sword, wasn't it? I mean, ever since we started having the uh, uh, the finals and then the semi-finals for the Premiership, the, the European was was in the middle of them. Uh, and some, some teams thrive on the fact that they continue playing through, uh, you know, a, a, a European final and the Premiership final. Others like the break. Um, I, I don't think there's any, any rhyme or reason to it. It's just one of those things. So, look, you know as well, you probably know better than we do, just how professional these guys are. Um, and yes, it's disruptive, but they, are, they know what they're doing. They know the calls already. They know their run-throughs already. Uh, and they're going, they're going to be um, totally professional, regardless of, um, of how long they get to train together. Yeah, and you've done all, they've done, they're doing all the analysis on Exeter. So they could do that, obviously, via video, et cetera. So they know they're doing that, what they would do at training, they're doing it at home. And obviously, it's not quite the same, but they wouldn't be training particularly um, flat out or anything this week anyway. It'd be very much captain's run-throughs and just little little, 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 little things to put right and to, to try against Exeter. But as I say, we'll see. Um, hopefully, it'll go, it'll go ahead with Wass in the final, but... There we go. That's uh, that's the times we're in, and it's it's unfortunate, but I think they've done very well. That there's only been really the sale, the sale outbreak, and the wasps is the second one. You know, in in ten or twelve weeks, I think that's yeah, that's a tribute to to the to the teams and the the work that they've put in with the COVID situation. Now there has been calls, and in fact, there's a petition at the moment, isn't there, to at least allow family members of those players. You, you mentioned it there about. Uh, it might be the, the the only chance some of these guys get to play in the Premiership final, and, and perhaps the family should be allowed in. It's not like um, you know, eighty three people can't socially distance in an eighty three seater thousand seater stadium, is it? No, it isn't. But it's come at the wrong time, hasn't it? Because everything's being tightened up. Um, I was reading the thing about the European uh, Cup final that the Department of Culture would only allow fifty six. Uh, squad 56 members from Exeter and Racing to actually attend the final. That included the players and the coaches and the medical staff and the uh, the Department of Culture and Media Sport actually asked, you have to fill in all the paperwork, why the Racing uh, president should be allowed to go and watch. Well, as he's a multi-billionaire who owns the club, you'd think there's actually he's got... But they basically don't understand... The damage that it's doing and there's a psychological damage and whenever we get some sort of respite in this we've got to get crowds back to football yeah. and rugby and other sports because i'm not sure how long professional rugby in its uh, in the form that we're in at the moment will last I'm, I'm, wasps are not alone there are other clubs uh, are you know are losing between half and a million pound a month uh, and they can't afford to carry on unless there's a government bailout, which who knows? We don't know about that. Um, it's it, it's worrying times. It's worrying times for all the players as well. That's their, it's their livelihood. Yeah, without a doubt. You know, so. It's not like they haven't had to take a pay cut either. And, you know, we spoke on this show last week, because uh, I know you watch it, so uh, you'd have heard this, uh, about Leicester and, and Gloucester for the, the remaining three weeks of, uh, of October, putting uh, all uh, their staff, back on furlough again yeah yeah I mean it, it is and it's, it's where, where you know where does it stop uh, if you make all these uh, you know if, if professional rugby suddenly ceases to exist in the form that it does now um, it, it's going to cause chaos all, all through the rugby world basically um, 
and who knows we don't know we don't know i just i'm just hoping that there's some common sense and that there's you know there is some sort of uh financial help coming if if we can't get crowds back before you know certainly just after christmas when the i mean the premiership clubs and just for an example if was had played bristol uh, under normal circumstances at the rico they would have got 28 30,000 that's worth about 6 or 700,000 pounds of the club that, that's you know that's that's a huge amount of money for, a, for you know we're, we're talking rugby not football you know premiership football which is a different animal but in terms of if rugby that's a huge amount of money so um you know, it is important we get crowds back, and I just think the government are very slow in some in some instances to try and actually, you know, encourage it. They're trying their best not to because they're just worried about further spikes. But um, there's a lot of precautions taken, so let's um, let's hope that that happens soon. Fingers crossed for for this uh, this coming Saturday. Fingers crossed. Definitely for Wasps, uh, and uh, you know, good luck to all the boys. Whoever, whoever gets to run out at the, at the final uh, this Saturday, good luck to you. But a special luck to Wasps, and if you're from Exeter, sorry, but Wasps are going to win. It's just they just start. Yeah. End on. They've got Dan it. and Dan Luke from Simon, and you've seen how the two are. Um, um, whoa, whoa, come whoa, on, James, whoa. you've got oh, a question about Simon. Oh, I've, got, I've got, I've got a question. Yes, but I'm going, I'm going to make a statement first. Wasps are only in the final. Because Sale weren't allowed to play in their semis. Sale would have turned Wasps over big time. Oh, right. Listen, where's the mute button? You can turn yourself <laughs> off before I turn you off. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Get out of here, you bloody Welsh English jock. I've got a lot of friends at Sale. A lot of friends. And I know, but you can still fuck off. <laughs> and they've been friends for a lot. So right. We've just got bombed by my puppy dog. <laughs> Ace. Uh, well, yeah, uh, now listen, um, we must say, just to interrupt, we must say, get well soon to Sam, who's had his flu jab today, so he's feeling a little bit icky, that's why he can't make it. Uh, Chris, as you know, you know why is... Why uh, icky? Because of his, what he did to me when I wasn't able to make uh, this 22... <laughs> <laughs> and I bet you any money... Julian is going to be next. There are too many jokes about what he might have done to you to make sure he couldn't make it tonight. You um, had to follow up from a couple of sessions ago to find out. <laughs> it's a family show. It's a family show. We're not going there. <laughs> the last Simon. time this was a family show, we, we weren't on air. Yeah, go on, James. You've got a question Simon. about uh, about Simon's Simon. career as well. Yeah, Simon, who was the hard hard ass number nine that kept you on the bench? Um, uh, initially, no. Uh, no, Dowie came just as I was. I played against Dowie a few times, but he was just he, he came. Um, he came, he he was just coming up as I was sort of going down, if you like. Nigel Melville was um, Nigel Melville. A guy called Richard Harding from Bristol and Richard Hill from Bath were the three. Yeah. Um, uh, the, the the irony was I was on the bench a couple of times, uh, and then Richard Harding came back from injury to, to take the bench place against Ireland and Nigel Melville broke his ankle at half to, at the end of the yeah. first half and Harding got on and it was <laughs> uh, well there you go I um, back in the early 80s I shadowed uh, Nigel Melville's England B tour and got to play three times in provincial games which are not uh, recorded of course <laughs> uh, but I was in the back row with Mickey Teague and Mickey Skinner and I was six foot one and 70, 18 stone and I was small. It was yeah. scary. Compared to Mickey Skinner, everybody on the planet is small apart from Bates. Mickey Skinner used to drink pints of uh, red wine just for fun. Sounds a bit like a night out with Trevor Leota, to be fair. <laughs> but you also have people like Nick Jevons, who was the same. And Jevo was like six foot four, bronzed, and, and absolutely yeah. just filled, filled the space. He was, and, and a very good player, obviously. There was some big. You know, they talk about rugby players being big now, but there were some big, I mean, naturally big people that didn't necessarily do all the weights that they do now and everything. No, because uh, they had proper jobs. Yeah, they were scaffolders and bricklayers. Well, farmers, like Mr. Winterbottom yeah. was a farmer originally. Who became a broker. I don't know how that works. Yeah, uh, yeah that'll be because of, oh, Harlequins. <laughs> uh, yeah, it might have been somehow. Simon. 
referring back to the meerkat, and I really want to try to find out uh, what what you recall is the meerkat's possibly <laughs> most embarrassing moment, and probably the proudest moment that you recall about the meerkat. Uh, when His memory had- isn't that good, mate. God, you're talking thirty odd years ago now. Mike was only there at the back. At the back, I was only there at the back end of Mike's school career. So, to be fair, I wasn't. I, wasn't, uh, I didn't teach him for the full full Monty seven years. So it was. Um, it was in the days when we at school had big numbers. So we had first team, second yeah. team, sometimes third team, and under sixteens. We had you know lots of lads playing rugby, uh, which isn't the, the case today. We're a lot smaller and not got so many. So. Um, uh, he, he was sort of uh, there, there and thereabouts, you know, as one of the one of the sort of um, second team. Yeah, be nice, they, mate. Nice, these lot are not nice to me. Just tell you how it is. It is what it Everybody is. Everybody knows I was a shit player, which is why I became a referee. Mike, you weren't that good. <laughs> <laughs> no, but um, I, I, I couldn't possibly. I can't really think, you know, off the top in terms of. Um, what what my most memorable moment with Mike is because he's just one of thousands of wonderful children that I've actually taught in my career. So what you're saying is he didn't stand out. No, he didn't. And that's because he was quite you know he wasn't very physical and he was. And I, I, in my first couple of years when Mike when, when Mike was sort of in the sixth form, I was I was doing the sort of the under 13s and the first team. So um, I didn't have anything to do with him because he was as he says he was so shit he never had a chance of getting in the in the, in the, the first. He's told twice, us he only twice, ever played first twice. team. Uh, well, Did I bollocks, mate? Did I bollocks? <laughs> and they played first team at under 11s, and that was about it. I could get the school magazine out and give a give you a reading, uh, basically. No, you can't, because I, I was the one that took all the photos, so I'm not in any of them. And, Mike, <laughs> were you the best water boy they could have possibly had? Uh, no, because we, 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 were, we were so bad, <laughs> we never had water on the side of the pit either. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't have water. You had a bunch. You had a. You had a. Oh, it was yeah, a ball with a sponge, sponge in it. Bucket. Do you know it's what? Like, the it, most uh, memorable part, and and Simon was not there, and I can't remember the master who was. Um, we played. We 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 took third on the on the. Um, it was a second team game at Manchester Grammar School. Absolutely piss wet through. You could dive on the twenty two and slide all the way in and score. Um, and by half time, we were down to thirteen because we'd only taken the bare fifteen. Um, and I ran across from one wing. Yes, they made me play on the wing back then before I became a fat bastard. And Simon says, no, you can play hooker instead. Um, so on this particular occasion, I'm playing wing, come and run in the cross, uh, tackle this guy, out we go, into, the, into the, uh, the 22 post, which had been put in so hard that the thing didn't come out the ground, it snapped and went straight down my knee like that. Um, a flap of skin's going over. Pouring with blood, teacher comes up, opens the first aid kit. We've got a bottle of Dettol and a roll of tape. Yeah, so he right. poured Dettol on it, taped it up, and said, On you go, son. That's fair enough. Yeah, bucket and sponge and, and a bunch Fucking of. Fucking hurt! It hurt! You mean so... you had Dettol? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm surprised he didn't just rub mud in it and go, There you go, carry on. The mud will stop it bleeding. Now, Simon, I'm very, very disappointed in you, sir. Sorry, sir. Won't do it again, sir. Um, that you've not got your drum kit out because since you know, man of many talents, you've taken up the drums. I know you, you, you're a bit behind the times. I, 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 I've, I always uh, am. I always they, they, am. They're undercover a little bit. I did. I did a little bit of drumming. I want, always wanted to play in a group, and I'm totally useless at music. So I got That's some. Showing your age when you call it a group and not a band. Oh, I don't know. Anyway, I, I, I fulfil my ambition. I actually I learned to play the drums not particularly well uh, and then I did play with a group for a song um, in public uh, and deleted all the videos Was that an air band? <laughs> yeah Dumb, uh, dumb yeah, Simon, it's... name the group Come on, give them a plug Who was it? Elvis and Fontenay. where were you playing? Elvis Fontenot and the Sugar Bees uh, <laughs> They're a brilliant swamp Cajun group play a lot of Cajun music really good Apart from when I'm on the drums, um, Simon, uh, I feel I feel that we need a trip uh, for you and your group slash band to Las Vegas. Phil, so, take to room Bellagio, mate. All done. They, they would, they would, they would definitely come to Las Vegas. It's just obviously there's not much going on at the moment. They can't go anywhere. So, 
Which, which uh, means it won't, be hard to, with a... it won't be hard to find you a place to play. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah I'm nerdy, yeah. We hope uh, to. Who, and do you know what? We've been trying uh, to get a video of Simon playing the drums all afternoon, and he swears blind there are none anymore. None that you're having. I was yeah. going to say, because we can't, because we can't see you um, playing your drums, what we want to do is because... Look, during lockdown, everybody has got a bookcase. Uh, I don't really, but um, Simon's got a very, very good bookcase there. So what we're going to do now is we're going to play 20 seconds of jingle music, and Simon has got to go and find a book to show us and something out of his trophy cabinet. Simon, off you go. Show is your first bit of show and tell for okay, today's assembly. You said, why was there a boot? And in fact, there are a pair of boots. But those oh, very were nice. They were Dan's boots that he played in the Premiership final in 2017 against Exeter. And it does say Premiership final, oh. whatever. So those are Dan's boots. And if, I, if only we got boots like that. Uh, the, the, the book I'll show you, because I keep on, on task in terms of rugby, is the Rugby Football Annual, I don't know if you can see <laughs> 14, 19, 30, 30. That's, that's Those are the years that um, James was referring to at Newcastle yeah, High well, School. That's the first edition of that annual set of annuals. It's worth about £300. That It costs sixpence. It's worth wow. about... Three hundred pound. I've got every one of those apart from two. So I'm look on the lookout for which two. Last... Which two are you missing? Nineteen twenty to twenty one and twenty one to twenty two. Is James <laughs> mentioned by first name in that one? No, I didn't go to school there. <laughs> no. We didn't play. We didn't play rugby at my school, old chap. No, this is very much a... the. Um, you know, it gives it gives all the laws of the game and everything from nineteen thirteen. That's so, when you, you could know, kick out. Mike, that's when you could kick shit Mike, out of each other. Yeah, just basically. I think you should find. Just go through. Can you find the scrum engagement law in that book? I'd be quite. We. I think we'd all be quite interested to learn what's there. But if anybody does, because I know we've got millions of viewers around the world. Um, if, if any of our millions of viewers and listeners uh, do have the what's it called the, the rugby annual of nineteen. <laughs> Rugby football annual. It's nineteen. I'll tell you what it is. It's nineteen twenty-one to twenty-two, and twenty-two to twenty-three. Those are the two that I need. They're, I have actually seen one of them, but it was very so, overpriced. Oh, was it? So there you go. If you've got any of those uh, two annuals, and they're yeah. not very overpriced, Simon will give you <laughs> sixpence because that's face value. Um, but he very much liked to hear off you. And if you want to get in touch with us, just look at the top of the screen. It says our uh, social media pages on there. Uh, just get in touch and uh, we will pass them on to Simon uh, and he will give you sixpence. If you're lucky, he might give you eight. So oh, come on, go. let's have a look at the uh, the scrum engagement sequence back then. Just Engage when ready. I want to know the scoring. Scoring? Yeah, the scoring as well. Uh, three points for a try. Uh Four points for a drop goal, three points for a penalty, and two for yep. a conversion. So a go. drop goal is worth four, and a try was worth three, and a conversion two. So yeah, it's so a drop goal was more was more important than a try. But it, but a try and a conversion was called a goal. Yeah, a, a goal was five points. Yeah, five. That's how it. Uh, I'm just trying to find the scrum. If it is. Yeah, I wonder if we've gone full circle and it says crouch, push, put, uh, touch, pause, no, engage on that one. It wouldn't be. It'd be engage when ready. Well, to be fair, I don't even think they said anything. Oh, it was it's it, actually rows engage, second, second rows join in when they can get there. No, it's probably just a simple go. <laughs> <laughs> the referee was still having, a, having finished his pipe off and, uh, and, and his whiskey in, on the sideline with his top hat on. No, that was in touch, judges. The blazers, yeah, with with their with their blazers, touch just with blazers. Should we bring that back? Yes or no? Vote now. <laughs> and the blazer had to be buttoned. That would be great for a classics game. 
do you know what? We we should actually do that next time we come out to Vegas. Long shorts. We bring our if we bring our blazers out with us, and we referee with blazers on. Yeah. Get Sam to wear his kilt. No, really, do not get Sam to wear a kilt, mate. If you've seen the state of his beard, imagine the state of his growler. <laughs> Fucking hell, you lot are weird. I mean, November for Sam means that he doesn't trim anything. And he lives in the sunshine like Phil. So just be careful what you wish for, boys, because he could have come over and he could show you. He is that kind of guy. Yeah, we and know. So, we we, saw... While we're trying to fill in time, he, he, Simon he is did still that. struggling to find the engagement. <laughs> the scrubbing's law is about that much. That's all it is. Yeah, I was going to say... Can we go back not... to that? There's not... <laughs> There's not uh, in the 99 law book. There is no um, engagement procedure. Yeah, it, it says a scrimmage no. can only take place in the field of play. It's formed by one or more players from each side closing round the ball when it is on the ground. So I'm not sure whether that's a rook. Well, that's a that's 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 a scrimmage, isn't it? That was a scrum. Or, yeah, back in the day. Or by they're closing it up in readiness to allow the ball to be put on the ground between them. And that's basically all it I is. I like this. I like this. Yeah, so you only need, you only need one person from each side. Yeah, that's, that, that's right. That's when the scrumars used to get uh, their uh, knuckles kicked. Oh, God. If you think about it, we actually can implement these 1912 laws today. because of the COVID laws. COVID laws. COVID laws. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. And on that bombshell, we're going to take a quick break, but we'll be back right with you just after this. has been amazing during lockdown when I've been dancing. It's meant that I can come to the park and put my headphones in and just listen to my music without the studio and else. They're the only headset that I've found so far that don't fall off. They stay on and they're not uncomfortable on your ears because they just rest outside your ears instead of actually going in. Uh, welcome back to part three of the 22 Dropouts, where during the break we've established that we have no viewers, so welcome back, no viewers. Uh, we've established that uh, James is a lazy bastard because his phone is set to only calculate up to 6,000 steps, and that he has a message on his phone telling him that his sex toy can be hacked. Um, now, not mine. Before the break, we... <laughs> not yours. Who, whose was it? It's got to be the wife's then. No, it was a, a, a warning. No, from, no, uh, no, no. There's only one reason. Well, there's two reasons. You have got something on your phone warning you about your sex toy could be hacked. And that's if it's A, your sex toy, or B, it's on your phone because you're using it on somebody else. That's it. End of story. No discussion. You're caught. Right. No. Right. Yeah, no, Mike, no, 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 James, 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 no, no, James, no. no Mike, no. now you're pandering to get viewership by talking about sex toys. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Because if I put hashtag sex when I upload this to the internet, we might actually get some weirdos who will watch it. <laughs> Instead of just us four. Actually, no, us three, because Simon doesn't watch it either. No, in fact, you know what? I need I'll be a regular viewer from now on. I, I, I should hope so, too. Um, and that's what all our, all our guests say, and they never see another episode. They only that's ever why. check out the one they're in, just in case. <laughs> no. We've actually talked a bit of rugby tonight, uh, and uh, we talked a bit about wasps, and we talked about a bit about England. Um, we talked about my shit rugby career. Um, now, one of the things we haven't yet discussed is um, anything that's in the rumor mill. Now, we know that uh, we're all we're all from the home nations, apart from Phil, who would like to be from the home nations because there's nothing going on in the USA at the moment, really. Uh, no, there isn't. Right. You, can, you may think there is, but even MLR, there's nothing going on in the States, even when that's really... Bledsoe. Not until Chris Bledsoe. Robshaw gets there. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, what have you got in the moment? The Alaska Tens or something. So, um, Simon, we always ask our guests, first of all, what's the latest rumour that you have heard around rugby? And we appreciate that this is a dire time of the season to be talking about rumours, 
but you are Dan Robson's dad, so come on. Yeah, well, I've got to be very careful what I say because obviously um, I probably know more than <laughs> I, I know more than uh, than a lot of a lot of things in terms of the what the public goes on in the public domain. So hey, listen, you cannot be as cagey as Jan McGinty was. Not He's been chance. on the show twice, and he has. You can tell when he wants to say but damn because his cheeks go that bright Irish red. Yeah, it's difficult though. You have to be, you have to be um, very circumspect about... I mean, one of the things I actually quite enjoy uh, is when people on social media put stuff, stuff about, in particular, wasps or whatever, something, and you actually know exactly what's going on and they're putting up these wild suppositions about what they think's going on and that this player's going to leave and this I mean there were you know there was you know a player from Wasp was down in the paper to be going back to New Zealand uh, and the fact that he's just bought a new house um, you know in where he lives not far from Dan and he's def definitely staying and it's like it, all these things and people I know he's definitely going to move and of course it, uh, the problem now on social media is that people just it just it gets exaggerated. It's like Boy Scouts playing Chinese whispers around the campfire, <laughs> isn't it? You know, at the end of the day, there's 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 a lot of stuff that that, that is 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 not true. Um, I think I think the the, the rumor thing that at the moment is going to be huge because of COVID, because of the fact that teams are under pressure financially. The Saracens thing, if you go on about the Saracens um, salary cap thing, the, the number of rumors that were find about what and what had happened and what didn't happen, which was so far wide of the mark, were unbelievable. But uh, I suppose that's that's really what drives the internet up to, to a large extent in, in lots of yeah. uh, lots of live things. But um, I'm not really a party. I mean, I do know stuff that goes on, and I'm not. I'm never gonna. I'm never gonna reveal it because it's not obviously it's not 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 party to do that. Um, but a lot of stuff is so wildly exaggerated. It's unbelievable. It is, it is. And I, I, do, I do know what you mean about social media, having read your posts about do referees referee the offside in the Premiership anymore because you do post those, or you used to post those quite, quite a lot on social well, media until you, you took up the why, whistle. Why, why are Exeter the only team that never get penalised five metres from their own line when they're defending? Every, you watch referees every time within the second pick and go will put their arm out and go... Offside penalty, playing advantage. Exeter never give a penalty away, and they're just as offside as anybody. Hashtag, else. you heard it here first, guys. Uh, listen, we've. Um, I think we took a vote beforehand, or I took a vote with myself. We're not going near Nigel's decision about the penalty against Racing on the try line. Okay, because he was right. There's uh, no, there's no offside line on the try line. End of. He was absolutely 100 percent right. He actually put down on Twitter because the thing said he said to the guys. I said we're not going here. Yeah, no, <laughs> we have done. No, no. He said leave the ball, our hands off. And, he, and Nigel Owens went on Twitter and said that he was referring to a, a particular player. And that he'll down the the extra reserve scrum half came in, uh, and because the ball was upright, and, and Gravely said that was not worth talking to. So you've got to take. So that. in that case, then if he says hands off to one player from Exeter, and another player from Exeter puts his hands on the ball, he's not the first man there. Yeah, but who's the, the one who's allowed to jackal? Uh, but we're not going there tonight. We're not. We're being nice. We're being nice tonight. Uh, it's it look. Games are won and lost by the decisions of everybody on the pitch, and that Absolutely. goes from from the players to uh, to the officials as well. We're, we're all human, and like it all, a bit um, decisions are decisions. Um, whether you you pass and you miss, you miss the pass. I mean, you you, you look at Finn. Um, how many times did he miss a man out? And once, twice, he got intercepted, uh, and uh, almost intercepted another couple of times. So those decisions doesn't matter who they're from. Um, but we expect players, don't we? We expect players to make mistakes. The thing is, we don't expect officials to, which, you know, uh, we set the bar very, very high for our officials. We set the bar high for ourselves. Um, but, um, 
you know, we are all human. That's why we weren't going there, but we did, so never mind. Um, and that's only because Simon wants to deflect away from um, his most famous story when he was on tour. Now, this can be anything, and you do not have to name names, Simon, but what you have to do is give us a few details about why a particular tour was most special for you and, um, and what happened. Oh gosh, I can't. Oof. So many, so many. Um, I'll tell you a quick. Well, not not in terms of anything too controversial, but we were in Argentina last year with the school. We played a, a, a very a, a, a town side out in the in, in the wilds of um, wilds of Argentina, and I have never ever been looked after so well. We actually, before the game, we were treated to a bottle of Malbec. That's before we did the warm up with the players. We really? played this game uh, in it was a beautiful day, real rural um, sort of rugby club. Played the game, really good game, couple of points in it. We had a couple of beers afterwards, and they said, "Right, you're back here for um, a meal with all the players uh, at nine o'clock." They start their evening meal at nine o'clock, um, and we basically. Um, left the clubhouse and that's and the kids were being hosted out by um, parents from Argentina and they uh, from the from the town we left the club at three o'clock in the morning which was fine but then they took us to a nightclub and the fact that we had to get the bus out of town at nine o'clock the next morning so we ended up with just two to get hours home. To, not to go to the next place oh uh, sweet and to be fair to the kids, they're, they're, most of them made it with it. They were only half an hour late. Um, it was the quietest bus I've ever had on tour because we went about three hours on this coach and they just they're absolutely zonked. But they never, this was really rural Argentina, they never get anybody from England going over there. And it was just, the hospitality was unbelievable. Just, you know, it's just what, that's what, I mean, and that goes for loads of tours, but that's the sort of thing that you go, actually, that's what touring is all about. And I was speaking fluent Spanish by the end of the night and don't know how, because I don't know any words in Did Spanish. Did anybody actually understand what you were saying? No, they didn't, but then they, no. you know, that, that's, that's, what, that's what happens. But uh, yeah, it's things like that to me are, the, are what makes touring. That, that's, I, think, um, I do got, think touring with schools like that, particularly when you've got a good a good age uh, grade where the, you, you can sort of half trust them. They know where, where to push and where yeah, not yeah. to. I, I, I honestly think they are some of the best tours as an adult you can ever go on, whether it's a chaperone or a coach, rather than going on the ones with the, the lads from your, your own, own club. I think some of those schools ones, because you are looked after so well, they're brilliant, aren't they? So um, look, I, I, let's let's talk about um, how things have gone locally because you know um, around the city of Stoke um, there are an extraordinary number of rugby clubs for a, what is a very very football orientated city. Do you see that product placement there, Phil? How he reached with the coke can towards the camera for you? Uh, we're, we're, Man, we're he's doing you over tonight. That's because <laughs> um, I. To be fair, to be fair, I don't. My drink. I actually drink it while it's still. Uh, when you want an advert or a plug for Diet Pepsi, yes, you do. <laughs> and by, by the way, Diet, Diet Pepsi, Steve, who is, uh, we know, is the uh, uh, SVP over in the States, here's your product placement right now. Okay, that's that one done. Um, one day, Pepsi will reward us for this. <laughs> um, We're going to just hashtag the shit out of With a lot. Time. In and around the city, what have you got? Six, six rugby clubs, and there's always that danger of it, it there just being too many. But in its day, there's been some some good good achievements into, as you say, the national league, Stoke and Longton, for for a little while, hasn't it? When the game was amateur, in particular pre '95, that that you got good 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 junior clubs. That, you know, you could get players back. Like I played for Stoke for three or four years after I came back from Mosey. You know, and we had a few other good players that come back from that sort of level. Uh, but nowadays, it's, the players are looking. It's interesting. I think it's one of the things that will change. I think a lot of junior clubs paying a bit of money out for players. I think that might uh, might go down a little bit after this COVID thing. I think there's a there's a much greater desire to play fixtures that are local, 
um, a bit like the old days where you played your, you played within your county almost. Um, and league rugby to me is killed. I think it's been one of the worst things for grassroots and junior rugby. And I'm not saying that there's not a pathway at a higher level. Uh, and, it, and obviously clubs that want to go and pay money out, that's, that's, that's up to them. But I think for the lower junior clubs, I think league rugby has been a disaster. I really do. I think that they were much happier playing within their, their county, within their area, and playing the same teams once or twice a year, you know, having a coach trips, whatever, and first and second team at the same venue even. Now, now you know, what, what you've said before, I mean, in, in Stoke-on-Trent, for example, I think the six clubs probably, there were probably 18, 19 teams on a Saturday between those six yep. clubs. Now you're getting about eight, you're getting first teams and the odd second team. Some clubs are struggling to get first teams out, um, and that's the way of the world. But um, I think I think it's the league rugby that's all consuming. I, I, I've always said it was a bad thing for the lower end of the, the scale. And if you want to go and play really competitive rugby and and you know pay money out and get into the national leagues, there should be a pathway for that. But for a majority of clubs, I don't think uh, it's you know you've paid money to coaches, you've paid money to players. And it, and it just spirals around. You end up back where you started from, having wasted, you know, a great deal of money, which could have gone to better causes. I, I, read, I read somewhere today that, you know, not just in rugby, but across all grassroots sports, 51% of grassroots clubs are either at break-even or in deficit before COVID. Now, that's going to go a lot, lot higher um, during this lockdown period and, and the time that we can't play. And, and I think we've all got to look at, relook at it, uh, relook at rugby, relook at all, uh, all sorts of grass sports, uh, and find a way that we can all work together and we can all support each other and we can bring some money and more importantly, bring the fun back into grassroots sport. Because so I think that's what's been missing for a while. Um, now, sadly, we have uh, reached the limit. Go, go on, Phil. Go on, Phil. You've got your hand oh, up. Sorry, I was going to mention there's ways around paying them, it's like getting them a real career or an opportunity to work. And then having them play rugby as part of that agreement, whether it's teaching or coaching or whatever, we don't we're need. Back to, we're back to the eight. No, but that needs to be on a much, much bigger scale so that it, it applies to almost everybody in the team and not just one or two. Sure. I mean, workforce development, it could be a pathway. And, and by the way, part of your give back is the community engagement, whatever. I don't know. Yeah. Now, uh, guys, uh, rumor time before we finish, uh, I forgot. It's time for the rumors. Uh, we know Simon hasn't got any because he skirted around the issue quite nicely. Uh, me, of course, I'm, I'm far too busy to, uh, to pull out any rumours. And uh, a bit like Simon, I wouldn't want to put people in an awkward position. Um, and James is fiddling with himself or his pen. So that must mean James has got a rumour. I've got two, both about Leicester. Yeah, Welford Road is going to get a rename to really? the Matoli Woods Welford Road for five years. And somebody's making Cast some money in lockdown then. Yeah, and Mr. Castro Giovanni may well be going back to Leicester. And where did you hear that? Never mind where you I heard it. You heard it here first, don't forget. Never mind where I heard it. You know I've got my my uh, secret squirrel. We don't ask for sources, but we do ask for names. Um, uh, so there you go. Hashtag you heard it here first. Castro Giovanni could be going back to Leicester Tigers, who, well, <laughs> who could be going bankrupt, who could be selling up, who are definitely putting all their players on furlough, uh, but might also take uh, the Queen Shilling from uh, Matoli Woods, who's one of their sponsors already anyway. Uh, so that would make sense. Um, in fact, talking of which, I did like the fact that Alliance, um, uh, since they pulled out of sponsoring um, Saracens have now taken on sponsoring Saracen, uh, the um, the Premier 15. So well done to Al Alliance for that. Uh, I think that's uh, that, that's the really good use of the extra money you've saved by not sponsoring Saris for another year. Phil, any rumours that you've heard of? Well, the only thing is the Premier Rugby event or the Premier Rugby League below uh, Major League Rugby in the United States is looking at putting together a few uh, competitions here in Vegas. We started some discussions this morning. So that we're coming. We're coming to ref it. Yeah, Simon. This is why you need your back ten pros 
ref on it. That's how pros does in the States what we do with Sevens Ref over here uh, and support, support the growth and the ambitions of referees and, and take them to places they could never otherwise go. I'm available. We try. We try. As long as, as, long as you're on the wine buying duty, how's that? That's a, that's a deal. Definitely. There you go. Well, again, hashtag you're here, they're here first. It's a, it's a great place to leave tonight's show. Uh, once again, thank you to our uh, guys. Um, sorry, Christopher's too busy dancing. Christopher is training to be a, um, a PE teacher, oh, Mr. Robson. Sorry, sir. What happened again, sir? Um, what the fuck have you lot done to him? I don't know. Does it involve a pole? <laughs> a pole? The last time oh. a PE teacher had a pole near me, uh, no, the last time a PE teacher <laughs> had a pole near me, I was in the Somebody swimming pool and I wanted to grab to the side and I got pushed away and pushed under the water, told fucking swim boy. Not right. pool. Welcome to a private stripper school. Pool. A stripper <laughs> pool. We know what you meant, but we weren't okay. going there. It's a family show. It's a family show, Philip. Come on. We're not in Vegas yet. Wait until we get there, then we'll do that. Uh, Chris, Chris's apologies. Uh, he won't be. He's got to learn dance on Monday evenings for for this term. Uh, Tom is busy doing strength and conditioning. Uh, Lawrence is uh, is back in Nairobi, uh, which is really good news for him. Um, it's been a long time since he's been back at university. So Lawrence is head down in the books. He's got a series of exams coming up. Uh, so, so he's not uh, looking after his big we, cock anymore. No, I hate to say this, but. His mummy is looking after his big cup. It weighs four and a half pounds and it's multicolored. No, four and a half, half kilos. kilos. Four and a half kilos. Sorry, four and a half kilos. And it services 32 chickens as well. Um, uh, <laughs> we're never going to get a major TV show out of this, are we? Um, thanks, ITV. Uh, and we, Piers Morgan, we love you. We didn't mean anything that we said about you last week. Sorry. We really, really apologise. Um, uh, uh, but, yeah, yeah. so, um, Lawrence, listen, we wish you well in, in your exams over the next month or so. Uh, Sam, you're just a bit of a wanker for not turning up tonight because you've, huh? you've had a flu jab, you big waste of job space. <laughs> uh, uh, Daryl oh. Christ knows what he's doing. The last time we saw Daryl, he was sucking it in on telly. Uh, that sounds wrong. <laughs> <laughs> well, we want that poll again, don't we? He was breathing it in on TV, um, and we'll, uh, you know, Ian, uh, Ian said to me six months ago, "This new job of mine will mean I'm free on the Monday night," and we've not seen him since. So, well done to the British Army for completely fucking up Ian uh, and his ability to join us on the Monday night. Anyway, um, that's just some of the twenty-two that we, we we say hello to. Oh, hello to Alex over in Dubai. Uh, you will be asleep by now because it's four hours ahead. Uh, and Roy. Bill, Roy, Roy, where's Roy? Since you came on the Seriously. show, have, have, you, have you buried him? Since you've come on the show, Roy's not been on the show. So to listen to all our international friends, wherever you may well be, Sweden, Malta, Kenya, Australia, New Zealand, uh, Uganda, India, South Canada. Africa, uh, Canada, Canada, Canada twice, uh, and uh, USA, well, maybe once or twice, to everybody that we've had on the show uh, in the last 29 episodes. And let's look forward to the next 29. It's good night from me. It's good night from my guys tonight. And it's a very good night, I hope, from Mr. Simon Robson, sir. What happened again, sir? Sorry, sir. Take care. Uh, and, and good luck, Wasps, at the weekend. Good luck, Dan. We, we pray for you and wish you well. Come on, Bristol. Good luck, you. Yeah. We'll begin October first, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, October first next week. We'll see you then.